which today we are going to be talking about the guardianship auditing. And I, I want to say uh, to start up, first of all, my name is Sharon Bach, and uh, I'm the clerk and controller for Palm Beach County. Uh, with me today, of course, is uh, the Honorable Ken Burke, who is the clerk and controller for Pinellas County. And um, the, uh, uh, from my county also is Anthony Palmieri. Anthony is uh, part of our Inspector General team, and the three of us today are going to be going over with you um, what we think, uh, what we believe is probably one of the best programs uh, for both uh, community outreach as well as being able to demonstrate to the public what the clerk and controllers can do uh, within the boundaries of the laws that uh, are, are given to us. And I say that because um, most of you probably know if you go out in the community, as Ken and I do, um, most people don't know what we do. You know, they, they, they think that we're that uh, face that, uh, the lawyers think we're that face that simply takes a, a document in and, and files it. Um, when I tell them that I have 750 employees, uh, most of the public falls over because they think we have four or five clerks that just take in the civil division or in the criminal division. They've got a very narrow view. This guardianship audit program, um, uh, and I, you'll learn a little bit more about it today, um, is, is really a, a part and parcel of what we can do as clerks to actually benefit the entire community. Um, you know, the uh, Florida statute 7444.368 uh, makes it the duty of the clerk to audit guardianship reports and advise the courts of those results. How many of you have uh, do your um, have audits within your probate or within your family law division where you do? So everybody should, because in order to do so, it's, it's actually a Florida statute. Well, that law, that statute was originated about 30 years ago in the 1980s, and frankly, uh, nothing has changed for the last 30 years where guardianships are concerned. Here in Palm Beach County, not here in Palm Beach County, but uh, in, uh, in Palm Beach County, and many of you probably look at the trends that you, uh, you know, your caseload, and you're looking where some of your caseload is going up or going down. In Palm Beach County, we noticed a really disturbing trend where there was a lot of um, rise. In fact, we had a 15% raise in guardianship cases since 2009. We've got about 2,700 open cases. Uh, we have uh, some of our, as you know, guardians can be the elderly, they can be the disabled, and they can even be children. Um, but what we've all put, another disturbing trend that we noticed is, is that there were some irregularities, more irregularities in our reports that we were seeing than what had been, than we had seen. So we saw that there may be correlation with the economy, with the downturn in the economy. About the same time in Palm Beach County, uh, what, what happened to me is, is that there was a very, very high profile case in which a um, very wealthy couple on Palm Beach um, got, had a, were getting a divorce and uh, the husband ended up killing the wife and uh, through, through a homicide and uh, the husband then ended up uh, getting cancer in jail and dying himself. He went to jail and he died. He was their small child, uh, underage child. Yes. You can go to jail for killing your wife. <laughs> <laughs> well, as our esteemed Union County clerk says, if she would have killed her husband the first time she thought about it, she'd been out of jail by now. Okay? <laughs> and I love that. You know, so. <laughs> so what happened is, is that the ward, uh, and these people were very, very wealthy, and what happened is, is that the young child, the ward, had, had um, a, an attorney was appointed to be his guardian, and frankly, uh, he ended up pilfering away uh, the ward's money. This is what, it hit the front page of the paper when the attorney was um, sued uh, for using all of the ward's money, and that's whenever I then began uh, looking around to, uh, the the, uh, actually, I began looking around to see what kind of enhanced uh, kinds of, um, of audits that we could do. I wanted to, and that's, this is where Pinellas County comes in, and I'm going to introduce uh, Ken in a second, but I wanted to also mention to you that 
this is what spurred me on in, in Palm Beach County, but I don't know if you know this, about 17, almost 18% of our population is uh, over uh, 65. We have, in Palm Beach County, we have the largest uh, population of over 85. And, uh, and as a result of that, you're seeing, as I say, more and more uh, what they're calling a great tsunami. So if you have an opportunity to look in your own county, you might want to look at whether or not your case count is going up uh, for uh, guardianships and whether or not there is a trend of, of uh, more and more appointments of guardians uh, for your wards. Well, I want to tell you that um, I was determined to find a model that was going to uh, not only allow us to do something in Palm Beach County, but a model that would also be a public outreach. And I didn't have to go very far because all I did was call our esteemed clerk from Pinellas County, uh, Ken Burke. And Ken, um, I found out, had probably had, had created um, and frankly, the best auditing program in the United States. And when I, I say that, because uh, right now, through the efforts of the last year of us creating this guardianship program, Anthony and I have spoken at, I get countless, countless uh, places in Palm Beach County, but more importantly, Ken, Hector, Anthony, and I are going to be meeting with the uh, guardian. We're going to be, uh, be giving our presentation to the Guardianship um, Association in Pinellas County in July. That's the uh, state association. And then Anthony and I are actually going out and uh, we're invited to the National Association to tell them about Florida's guardianship program. You're here today because what we would like to do is put this guardianship program on the map. And one of the ways that we can put this on the map is by all of you, all of the clerks in all 67 counties, looking at this and considering whether or not it would be something that you might want to use. Now, I want to tell you, it doesn't matter whether or not you come from a county that's only 30,000 or you come from a county that's, you know, 3 million like Dade County. But the, the concept of protecting the most vulnerable citizens that we have at the most vulnerable time in their lives is, is really protecting the dignity uh, of a person. And if there's something that we do as clerks, is, is I always say we're a neutral third party, and what we do as a neutral third party is look out for the public. We're the public's watchdog. If there was ever an opportunity for us to pull together at a statewide level and begin protecting these most vulnerable people and doing it as in, in a collective way, it is now. I would tell you, we took Penn's program and we were able to model it in Palm Beach County. And again, whether or not you wrench it up because you're bigger or wrench it down because you're smaller, it's a community outreach program that is very, very helpful and it really is something that um, puts the clerks on the map, so to speak. So, I'm going to now turn this over to Ken Burke because he is, uh, I'd like Ken, if he would, to uh, tell us a little bit about the background in Pinellas uh, County and what steps that you've taken and uh, how you actually started the program, Ken. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. And, uh, Sharon, I really appreciate you because I've never been called a model before. So this, is, this is something which is very, very exciting for me to be a model for the first time. The, uh, if you think about the whole concept of a guardianship, and, Karen, and Sharon just touched on this, the most vulnerable people, and if you look at it from a court perspective, usually in civil proceedings, there's, a part, there's there are two parties involved, they, they bring their matter to the courts to resolve. Um, and God's with us today here. This is that important. He wants us to know the importance of guardianships. It is an omen. But with, and if you think about it, the court has made a determination. The court has made a determination that a person can manage their own assets, either because they're a minor or because they're mentally incapacitated, and that a guardian has to be appointed. And this is not appointed by someone else, it's appointed by the court to say they're going to manage those assets. The assets of that person, and they're going to be the guardian of the person, it could be two separate people. 
But that's a very big thing from the court system to look at and say, my gosh, we've appointed someone to take care of all of Alex's assets, how they're spent, try to get money if, they, if, they, if, they, if there's little money there from Social Security or other sources, and making sure it's all managed properly so they go to the care of Alex. Alex is mentally here with us, so that's not a problem. We don't need to appoint a guardianship for him. But if you think about that, that's a very serious matter for the court. And it's unlike other matters, other than probably like a Baker Act, where there's that type of intrusion into a person's life by the court system, by government. And that's why, if you put yourself in that type of mentality, that's why this issue is so important that it be done correctly. And in Pinellas County, and Sharon was very kind in her compliments for Pinellas County, but I can't claim the credit. It really was due to my predecessor, Carlene de Blanker, who set up this very aggressive auditing standards for our guardianships in Pinellas County. Um, and she did a magnificent job in setting it up. And in so many cases, the reason why this was set up is because of big abuses in Pinellas County in guardianships. We probably had the poster child for a lawyer uh, in Lauren Sills. She had several hundred guardianships, and she was stealing from the guardianships. Okay? And that's what really was the catalyst um, to really, for the courts to look and say, my gosh, we've appointed this attorney, we've appointed the guardian, and, and, and there's money missing in all these guardianships. We have a responsibility to do better. And so that's where this started with. Now, there's obviously, and I'm not sure, and I don't want to consult anyone's knowledge of this area. Some of you may be very knowledgeable in guardianships. Some of you, you told me you're here for, uh, just joined the clerk's office a short time ago. But obviously, there's two types of guardians who are appointed. There's the professional guardians, and in Pinellas Head County, we have a very robust Professional Guardianship Association in Tyler, Taylor County. I'm sure there's not a guardianship association. There's very few people who are involved with this, and if there's any guardianship, they're probably almost all family guardianships. Um, and that's our that's the big problem that we have is we have people two different types. It's kind of like with lawyers. You have the people who bring a civil lawsuit who are lawyers. Hopefully, they know what they're doing, and then we have the general public who tries filling it out themselves without that knowledge base of how to do something. Um, the same applies here with guardians. Uh, we have professional guardians. And I can tell you in Pinellas County, um, we're very fortunate because our problems are not with the professional guardians. Um, our problems tend to be with the family appointed guardianships. What's unfortunate, and this is something you should work with your judiciary on, in our county for the longest time, they waived the training for family guardians. Training was required for professional guardians, and, and it was waived for the family guardians. It almost seemed like the reverse. I mean, if you're a professional, you should do your own training, and you know to do that. But the family member who's appointed, they oftentimes are the ones who create the problem. Because mother is now incapacitated. They have control over her assets. Well, I think mother wanted us to go on this vacation this year. And so that $5,000 for our ski trip, she would want us to do that. And who knows? Maybe mother did. Okay? But it's not, that's the, the part of the guardian is making sure that approval process is granted. And they go through the proper uh, the channels to uh, get court approval. And they make their case, yes. Mother's always given us $5,000 a year for us to take our ski vacation. And I'm sure that's a continual thing. It may make sense. It may not be bad. Um, but that's what our job is in the clerk's office on that annual accounting to make sure that every documentation for an item like a $5,000 ski vacation has been approved by the court. And if it has not been approved, then there's not proper receipts for other items, such as roof repairs to mother's house, um, that, that there was, we can even look at the official records. Was there a notice of commencement? So we, 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 we kind of do things to make sure that goes beyond just looking at a receipt as, 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 as much as we can. And we're going to get into the three different levels of audits. I won't go through that now. But that's the general idea, is making sure that everything that's on that accounting, and we prepare a um, order to disapprove, if, if, uh, is that the correct terminology, Colleen? Um, if, the, if, the, if there is not a, um, if there's a problem, um, and actually it falls upon our clerk's office to prepare that order. Does 
every clerk in office prepare orders to disprove the accounting? Which, and, and Jean, what is your, who prepares the order in your um, Milwaukee County? The probate division of the courts. Yes, we do have a review that says that there are these problems, but we leave it up to the court to say, you know, because sometimes the things that we think are a problem, they don't think are a problem. Right. So we, uh, we leave it up to the court. Usually, if we find a problem, they issue an order to screw the schedule of the Well, and, and Gene, let me tell you this. We don't elect to do that. We have an administrative order mandating the clerk to prepare the order to disprove. So uh, it's, it's, yeah, uh, and I think that this is a good type of discussion because as we go around the state, Buddy and I have gone around the state uh, with uh, the CCOC budget and finance, there's so many different requirements of different clerk's offices um, by the court and duties, and a lot of this time, is it the duty of the court or is it the duty of the clerk? Um, in our county, they've assigned a lot of duties, some which I, I agree with. Um, have, are, are not clerk duties that, that they have that they have pushed on us, and we have fought back a little, saying no, you need to take these over, and, and they push back on us. Unfortunately, unfortunately, I don't get to do administrative orders; they do. I, and I'm not anti-court. I don't mean to, but it, it, but this type of but a guardianship is the item. This is one of the questions that comes up: What are your duties in your clerk's office, and what are the duties of the court? We have magistrates in Pinellas County who handle. Uh, probate matters, and we send it to the magistrate, and then they go to the judge. That's the review process, but the preparation is on our part. Can tell, tell um, us a little bit about the administration. You mentioned about the administrative order and, and how different every county is, but tell us a little bit about the administrative order and how uh, uh, Carlene or you or, uh, created this enhanced audit from where we were with just the statute. We have, and we had two administrative orders, one in 2006, and, and actually because of the issues that we just talked about, it was putting so much of the burden on the clerk's office uh, that we uh, asked the judiciary and talk with them about taking some responsibilities back over, and they agreed to that and stopped a lot of the requirements of the clerk. So we have an administrative order, and if you all have pencil and paper, um, it's Administrative Order 2009-036. And if you go on the Six Judicial Circuits website, um, you can, their administrative orders are done by year. So you can search by year. So go into 2009 and get Administrative Order 36. And, and it, it's very helpful because it shows what the responsibilities um, of the clerk are according to the court in our, in our particular circuit. And this applies both to Pinellas and Pasco County. Um, Paula O'Neill's here from Pasco County. And it talks about the discrepancies that we find in, in accounting, uh, what we're supposed to do. Um, and and we, what we have in Pinellas County is have three different levels. Is it fine to get into that at this time? Okay, yes. Okay, so I won't get into that. Do um, you want to get into that now? Yeah, you know, uh, thank you. Um, Ken is so absolutely correct uh, in bringing up again how, how different it is, but one of the things I just wanted to highlight of what he said is, is that um, what Pinellas County did was took the basic statute and enhanced it in, and it became a partner with the, uh, with the probate judges or the probate magistrates. Um, what we did in our county is went up to Pinellas County, met with his Inspector General uh, Division, and basically stole their AO. Okay, we, we just stole it lock, stock, and barrel. So he, he is right. Uh, we also, but when we went down to Palm Beach County, um, we immediately agreed, I had a meeting with my chief judge, took all of the collateral material that Ken has, and um, took the AO and then negotiated the, uh, negotiated what we wanted to do with our chief judge. And I will say this, um, the, the, in Pinellas County, and Ken will get into this a little bit more, but in Pinellas County, his, he has a full-time person that works directly with the probate judges. And because we're big enough to be able to do this, not everybody would, you know, would be able to do it. But I will tell you, um, she, in his case, it's a woman, a, 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 she's a lawyer too, isn't she, Ken? No. No, she isn't, okay. And uh, anyway, she is the auditor, and she works very, very closely with the, with the judge. And they have grown to depend on what she says. They actually ask her questions, give audits, etc. 
uh, uh, ask her questions about what she thinks. Now, we, as I say, created the AO. Our AO is a little different because each of you, you know, if you're talking to your chief judges, you're going to have something a little bit different. Uh, and ours is a little different, but our motto is Pinellas Counties. Now I'm going to introduce to you uh, Anthony Romeri because Anthony is actually going to talk about what it is that uh, they created in Pinellas County that we brought down into um, uh, Palm Beach County and how we enhanced the statute by using the mechanism of the administrative order. Anthony? Thank you. I also have some uh, examples uh, to share with you today. As uh, Clerk Burke mentioned, the uh, Clerk's Inspector General performs these enhanced audits and uh, we have three levels of these enhanced audits and uh, very simply we call them level one, level two, and level three. Um, you can't get any more simple than that. But there really are big differences between the different levels. Um, our level one audits are, are very basic uh, that we must perform on the guardianship reports per the Florida statute, uh, which, is a, which is the absolute statutory minimum. Uh, they're high level reviews uh, that we ensure that the guardianship reports are prepared timely, completely and accurately. Now, uh, as Clerk Fox says, we've been doing these audits for the last 30 years, and that that type of audit is really not changing with this program. Uh, but again, we felt that the statutory minimum audits were just not enough. Um, so through the administrative order in Palm Beach County, we established two additional levels of audits. Um, and again, these are conducted by um, the clerk's accredited division of inspector general. Uh, these audits are significantly more in depth. Level two audits look at the full range of guardianship reports from the very first petition that is filed before the guardianship or, or during the process that the guardianship is being opened, um, all the way to the final accounting right before the guardianship is closed. And we're looking for any issue that may negatively impact either the ward or the guardianship. Uh, there's three ways that a guardianship case is going to get selected for an enhanced audit. As we've already discussed, we've been conducting these level one audits, the statutory minimum audits, uh, and we do that for 100% of the guardianship reports that are filed. Um, we'll, the, the clerk's inspector then will, will review these level one audits and we'll take some of those cases and we'll perform a level two or a level three audit on them. Another way that a guardianship case will get an enhanced level two or level three audit is if the clerk receives a report through the guardianship fraud hotline. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. I have some slides a little bit later on on the guardianship fraud hotline. Lastly, a judge or magistrate can request that the clerk's IG form an audit on a specific case. And that's exactly what happened in this, this example. A judge requested that we uh, do a level two on this case. Uh, this guardianship case is also an example of when an attorney is appointed as a guardian. Now on, on the screen, this is one of the first petitions that's filed by the attorney. It's called the application of guardian. Now on the, on the application, question number 29 asks if the guardian has ever been discharged from employment, and in this example, the attorney answered no. Now since the guardian was an attorney, uh, we reviewed Florida Bar licensure information, and, and we noticed that the attorney was subject uh, to a disciplinary action. Now reading through the Florida Bar uh, complaint, we discovered that the disciplinary action was direct re directly related to the attorney's last job. During the complaint process, the, the attorney testified before a, a bar grievance committee, and the attorney uh, said that the reason for leaving her last job was that she was fired. She didn't say this once during the, the whole transcript, she said it like 20 times that she was fired. It turned out that the attorney was fired by the law firm 
because of some unethical as well as some fraudulent things she was doing during her employment. So you, you could say that the attorney's answer on the guardianship application uh, you know, was unethical also because it you know, lacked complete candor. Um, it, was, it was also a fraudulent appointment as the guardian. Uh, th that last example illustrates how the clerk uses non-court records uh, to audit these guardianship cases, and we call this third-party verification. Yeah, certainly. Also, what happens is, in Pinellas, for example, we have a staff of seven or eight auditors who are the desk auditors. They're the people who uh, work on the court side operation. They're reviewing uh, for uh, the statutory requirements for the audit and um, that type of thing. But often, we have things that just bump up to a level two. Things uh, like the brokerage accounts, uh, the through these of uh, Ms. Barney and Weber, the Merrill Lynch's. Some of these uh, brokerage accounts get so complex as far as dividend reinvestments, the, um, and a lot of times these securities were held by the person. Some of them may be uh, securities we're not familiar with, the ventures, uh, the bonds, uh, all types of different types of security margin accounts. And, and when, that, when that comes in, you can't ask a, a person who is really doing a compliance checklist audit, that our best auditors are very confident, but really to have a great understanding of these brokerage accounts, it takes a more sophisticated person. And so we, that, that automatically bumps it up, especially if the, if the desk auditor does not feel comfortable with the brokerage account, because is there the possibility of the, uh, the stockbroker returning to the, the account? Um, all types of issues come there, and just the, the complexity of the thing, that's something that would bring, bring it up to a, a level two. So it not necessarily has to do with uh, the, the judge requiring it. It may just be a real estate transaction took place that year. That's, again, something we bump up. We can check with the property appraiser's office to see what the assessment on that property. We can do some, um, is the uh, real estate commission, what's the standard for your, for your county? Um, again, the real estate transaction will bump up um, because a lot of times when mom, the mother gets, uh, you know, incapacitated, she's moved into a nursing home and they sell the home for proceeds. So those are big transactions which, which will take a little bit more scrutiny. So it's not just those items there. It may be things, it doesn't pass, when those are very tangible that I mentioned, but also it doesn't pass the smell test. You know, your desk auditors, what we call them, like, uh, you may call them something else, the ones doing the basic checklist audit, if it doesn't pass that smell test, there's something unusual there. And, and we'll get into this. I mean, if you see a person who's 90-some years old having $17,000 worth of dental work, okay, maybe that's a trigger. It may be right. But at least, my gosh, maybe we need to look into this and see is, is $17,000 worth, or maybe there's a problem here of some type. And let's boost it up to the to the level two audit and have the auditor do, do some more investigation. And these are the type of these examples, by the way, folks, a real example that we've had in Pinellas County. So all those things, the brokerage churning, um, the account, uh, the, the, uh, the real estate, um, for, uh, really discounted a real estate transaction and money changing hands outside that real estate transaction and um, fraudulent dental bills. Um, we, we have a lot more than that, but those are ones that uh, just bode well as to why we go to level two. And as a point too, and Ken makes an excellent point, um, you, everyone here has at least one person who, as Ken calls them, desk auditors. Uh, we have, I think, seven or eight as well in, in all of our branches. But this program allowed us to even have more enhanced training. Anthony, who is our full-time auditor of uh, just these uh, guardianships. This is what Anthony does, by the way. I, I didn't mention that before, and I apologize to you. Uh, he's a certified fraud examiner, he's got his JD, he's got, so what part of what his job is also is to go in and train our desk auditors and exactly what Ken was just saying. Um, they've been seeing these things for years. They've just have not had an outlet of, as to what to do with it. 
now through this program because the judge understands and knows that we're going to be looking at these more carefully. We have uh, enhanced training for our desk auditors and the judge is expecting this from us. So the partnership is just a very natural and um, very, very much appreciated by the, uh, by the judiciary. Anthony? Okay, two, two more items on that. Um, it's important that you know, unlike a lot of the work that we do in the clerk's office, this work is specifically for the courts. This is not for the general public. We're performing the audit not for, um, it's, first of all, the, the audit of the, the, our working papers are not available to the public. They are confidential documents in the court file, but they're being prepared to help the court in this important uh, monitoring of the, the person's assets. They're, they're not for the general public, it's for the court. That's a, that's the, the, we're servicing the court in this particular duty, and I think you have to put that mentality on it too. That that's why the partnership with the judiciary is just so extremely important. Right. I have a question. There's a question. Yes. Uh, so, how does the bar react to this level of scrutiny? Uh, the uh, or who asked that question? Jeez, Hi. Hi. Yeah. Um, you know, in our county, I'm an attorney uh, anyway, and um, the bar uh, we. This is just natural uh, with the bar. In fact, um, uh, Ken said mentions it a little bit, and, and Anthony too. Um, a lot, most of the guardian, professional guardian guardians, uh, a lot of them are lawyers, and um, they. <laughs> I don't know if this happened in Kent's County, but this is this happened in our county. All right. When we started this guardianship program, um, we went out and we really did a big PR program around it. Um, we we rolled it out as a campaign. We have uh, posters. We had all kind of things. We have these cards, and I got to tell you, um, it created quite a scare in the in the bar. Okay. And all these attorneys, these probate attorneys. Well, I got to tell you, they give us calls now. They call Anthony. They call me. They want us to come and speak to them because they're actually afraid. And uh, Anthony has a wonderful, wonderful program that he gives about uh, what to look for, what to do. We are invited constantly to come in and, and all kinds of uh, venues to teach them about what we look for. And it's really the professional guardian. It's exactly what Ken earlier said. It's the professional guardians that want to clean up the, uh, uh, the bad guardians, so to speak. But we've, and in fact, Anthony's going to tell you that we have found some professional guardians in Palm Beach County that were taking advantage of their wards um, it, it, just as much as the non-professional guardian. Um, can, why don't you go through a few more and then I'll, but the relationship is very good. Yeah, just one additional thing to add to that is, um, you know, a lot of people welcome, you know, they, they want to raise their ethical standards, uh, so they, they welcome the, the, the scrutiny. Uh, on the other hand, I do have a couple of attorneys that are not taking guardianship cases any longer. Uh, kind of makes you scratch your head and wonder, what, you know, why they're not doing that. You know, I don't want the scrutiny, I'm not, I'm not doing guardianships anymore in, in, in the county. Um, so G, G, what do you feel would be the pushback? Well, I mean, we...
Do you address it proactively or do you wait until there's abuses in your county and then respond? And, and there were some substantive abuses in Pinellas County and the courts responded. So that's that's the decision to be made. And, and, and it, it isn't, if you take into account your, the culture of your county, the culture of your judiciary, the culture of your um, uh, uh, legal community, and also the exposure. How many guardianships do you have, the nature of them? Um, it, it, actually, some of our most problematic guardianships are um, the minor guardianships. Because it's very hard to define what are the expenditures that are appropriate for the child at this time, and what are the ones that should be left for the educational purposes, and, and that, and, and so you get into. But at least um, there's there's a justification, and, and that's what our audits do is is make it, it bring these matters to the attention of the court to make sure that the court's aware of what they're deciding and are questioning more. Um, by gosh. The assets aren't going to last until the person turns 18 um, under this spending scenario. Maybe we need to look at the spending scenario, and maybe there's some uh, some problem areas. And and we've had in, in Pinellas County, we actually had a guardianship of a uh, where the the mother was guardian um, of a uh, a substantial amount of funds for her two children, um, and she was a prominent lawyer a lawyer with a prominent law firm very prominent firm over in Tampa. And she was not turning in her accountings. I mean, it just is astounding to me how a lawyer cannot be turning in the accountings. And I think even she thought, well, this is my kid's money, and I'm their mother. Um, I mean, that there's, there's, I mean, and she's a lawyer at a prominent law firm. I got to the point where I called the managing partner of that law firm, who I happen to know, and just said, you know, you have a lawyer here who's gonna have, matter of fact, uh, 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 she had a bar complaint against her because of this. the judge filed a bar complaint against the, the lawyer because of this. I mean, so you get to, you know, situations here where the, the protection, again, is the court's duty to protect uh, as best they can, and it's us to supply the information to the court and the system in this duty. So all these factors come into being. Another issue, too, uh, buddy, is that, to remember, uh, this law, the, the laws that we're following right now are 30 years old. And because we're now hooked to the hip with the guardianship association, uh, both in the state and, and, um, and lo our local, our Palm Beach County chapter, as well as the state chapter, I can tell you, they have been, um, the guardianship association has been lobbying for years to get the enhanced audits or some changes. And they're actually looking to us now to help them through their, uh, you know, up in Tallahassee so that they can begin really putting some substance into these laws. And they're taking our program and this, again, Pinellas' program and our program, and we're going to be helping them, at least in Palm Beach County, to talk to our delegation about uh, statutorily enhancing uh, the uh, Chapter you know, 744. Um, so that might be a way uh, for you to start thinking about it as well. i got to tell you, in our community, and I know in Ken's community, what he was just saying here, it has not that we've gotten zero pushback, absolutely zero. Um, we, if anything, they've been lauding us, and uh, be, mostly because of the partnership that we have with the judges. Our, our enhancement here, folks, then, if something does go wrong, we don't want anybody to say earlier. Yeah. So that was kind of all fair. We get some pushback, and we just want to try that. And that, buddy, that question, we just. When the, the incident which I told in the beginning got Lauren Stills, the attorney who had hundreds of guardianships, that was the question, where were the courts there? Um, probably didn't get the clerk scrutinized as much back then, and I was working for a law firm and reading the articles, you know, but it was really where was the courts protecting um, all these all, all these guardianships. And so that's what brought the enhanced scrutiny here. Um, and, and, and buddy, uh, when the budget cuts came over the past several years, and Miriam, um, Miriam was general counsel for our office. Um, we wrote to the, the judiciary a very, very detailed, probably 17-page letter um, with all asking, basically, um, we're not statutorily required to do a lot of these things. Um, and we wanted to just keep on our most aggressive with the guardianships that we thought were the highest risk. And basically, we got a letter back from the chief judge, you know, accusing us of killing children and, you know, um, 
you know, and, and, and everything else, that we're such these bad people that aren't protect, you know, help protect, help protect the citizens of our county. So I mean, you know, the culture of your county and your judiciary, your legal community, and the past abuses really does help define this issue. But you don't, you know, you don't want to let the afterwards and have the finger pointed to you and say, well, we did nothing. Yeah, one other thing, just to just to, uh, finish a comment uh, on your question. Uh, one of the things that uh, you should add to your list of you know, things to uh, research is the Attorney General's opinion. Uh, it was a 2004 opinion, uh, number 33. Um, and in that, it defines what an audit is in the context of the guardianship audits. Uh, and basically, the Attorney General's opinion said there's really no definition of audit. Um, and we, we take it, you know, we apply the principles that uh, the Institute of Internal Auditors, uh, you know, uh, you know, say, but. Uh, 2004, 33. Again, I, I, Bobby and Gina brought up very good points, and that, that's why I brought up about the brokerage account and the, the real estate transactions. Um, those are ones which we probably uh, can come under more scrutiny because those were included in the, the accountings. Um, and, and that's something where they're so complex, some of them, and I'm a CPA and I used to prepare people's taxes, and, and I used to hate getting some of these broker statements. It, it took you just so much time to review the, the darn things and to figure out what was happening and where the beginning balance was and what happened to all the transactions. But, how would look? They said, well, gosh, we provided those, and, and that clerk's office didn't see that there was $10,000 stolen from there, you know, by this, you know, by some distribution that we don't catch. Um, and that's why I'm thinking, you know, and I guess your analysis of your office, how you're going to approach this, on that type of thing, things given to you, here's, this is not, you have to go hunt for receipts, and there may have been roof work that was overcharged, so that's a little bit harder thing, but a brokerage account, if you're given the whole year activity, and you don't discover a problem, well, that's going to come back to your office, I can tell you that. And on a real estate transaction, if, if the homes in that neighborhood are selling for 120000 and, and this is assessed for 100000 on the, assess the property appraiser, and you, and you have a real estate transaction selling that home for $40,000, and they're saying, gosh, you're a government entity, you didn't go and, and look and see that even what the property appraiser had this for. I mean, those are the types of, that's why I use those two examples specifically, because those are very tangible, and those are something, you know, your local newspaper, you're going to look, blah, 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 how do I answer this question, you know, because they will expect you to have that basic level. Now, you may not be doing that basic level right now, but you may want to consider on those items that are that are being submitted to you, which really are, are take some effort to scrutinize, but are, um, but you can, you'll be held under um, the microscope scope if there is failure on those. Some of the examples we're going to give you up here, it's very hard. It really takes a trained person um, to, to discover these errors and, and, and that we've, we've found of, of manipulating bank statements. Um, people aren't going to expect you to do that. People aren't going to expect you to catch, you know, in, in our civil side, people don't expect you to catch a a, a forged judge's signature that looks somewhat similar. I mean, you know, you know that's a standard. That, that those are that's a lot more scrutiny. And the same with the, the auditing here. We're going to show you things which are a lot more complex and are or have a different level of of of, of, of person to find those types of things. But the things I mentioned just now are things that a lot of our offices here here we attach that HUD statement to the thing that that, that, that was there and everything's fine. Um, and we never did the scrutiny of, the, of, of looking at these other records until all this um, fraud took place in Pinellas County. Okay, I'd, I'd like to show you some more examples, uh, you know, getting back to the third party verification, which is very simply, we're, we're, you know, we're, tra we're tracing the guardianship assets, liabilities, um, back to the source. We're, 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 we're following the money back to whether that be the IRS, Social Security Administration, back to the bank, whatever the source is. Um, I'd like to show you an example of, of this third-party verification. Uh, this is another guardianship case that was referred to us uh, this time by a magistrate. Uh, this is the initial inventory that the guardians are required to submit. Uh, you know, lists everything that the ward owns. 
Uh, it's a complete list of you know, all, all their liabilities, all, all their assets, uh, all their income, just you know, everything is listed. Um, if you notice in the red box, this ward, uh, who by the way, suffered from dementia, uh, she owned a condo, uh, and the condo had a worth of $45,000. Um, but the next line down, she had a mortgage liability of $60,000. So she was uh, underwater on this condo. Um, so we performed the third party verification. First, we looked at Palm Beach County's official records. And uh, we determined that the mortgage was really a home equity line of credit. Um, the home equity line of credit, the other red box, was $486,000. Now, you would expect some portion of that uh, line of credit, some portion of that $86,000 to show up as uh, maybe a you know, cash asset on that inventory. And we're going to go back to the inventory. Um, and as you can see, it, it, it is not. Um, there was an annuity listed for $37,543, uh, but none of the $86,000 home equity line of credit. So uh, again, kind of, you know, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a head scratcher, kind of, you know, makes you want to ask where did that money go to? Uh, so we reported this to the court as a, uh, you know, a, a potential red flag. Um, the last two examples that I, that I was able to give to you, the, uh, the $86,000 and the guardianship application, uh, the lack of candor application, um, they're really examples of, of, uh, of these red flags. And, you know, a red flag is nothing more than an area of concern. Um, in an auditor's mind, the more red flags that are present, uh, you know, the more risk there is. Uh, and the more in depth our audit is going to be. Uh, in your in your handouts in, in the uh, white uh, packet, I've included 25 red flags that our office sees. Uh, I'm sure uh, Pinellas County sees on a, I mean on a daily basis. Um, I'd like to go through a couple of those and show you some some more you know more interesting uh, examples on this. Um, this I, this one. I always enjoy looking at, um, it's, it has to do with red flag number eight, and it gets back to the lack of supporting documentation. Uh, below the post-it notes and on the side of the post-it note there are two handwritten notes. Uh, they're both signed by Mickey, uh, who, is the, who is the guardian, Mickey's the guardian. And Mickey submitted these to the clerk as documentation to prove a six-digit bank account balance, and if you read the, note, the handwritten note, it says, oh, I went to the teller, and uh, this is what the teller told me the balance was, so I thought that was um, a good example. You know, so despite you know, Mickey's handwritten notes, this would not be sufficient documentation. I'll give you another example of a red flag. Number 11 is the clerk's inspector general is more concerned when there's no separation of duties. Uh, in this example, the guardian was yet another attorney. Um, the attorney was the guardian, the guardian was the attorney, hence the no separation of, 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 of duties. Uh, this is a petition to authorize guardianship fee, uh, fees. The fees are disbursement that's feed into the uh, annual account. And so you can see here that the uh, guardian charged uh, 0 0.8 hours, or 48 minutes, for depositing an annuity check. Now, at $125 an hour, uh, which was the, the uh, guardian rate, not the attorney rate, uh, the attorney was reimbursed uh, $100. Um, we took that petition and we compared it to a corresponding bank deposit slip. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you uh, play the auditor take a look at the deposit slip, and let, let me know if you see anything unusual about this deposit slip. I'll give you a moment. I see no hands going on, so I'm going to give you a hint. Right. Take a look at the time of the transaction. Right. If, you, if, you, uh, if you can read military time, uh, that is 5.57. Now, I'm going to let you take a guess what time 
but then the bank closed on uh, July 2nd, 2010. The bank closed at 6 o'clock, okay? Um, to top things off, the location of the branch was about a half a mile from the attorney's house. All right, so uh, as a result of the audit, we were able to determine that the attorney left his law firm for the day. On his commute home, he stopped by the bank, which was right by the house, right by his house. He went through the drive-thru, deposited the check, and went home, and he was paid a hundred dollars for his commute home. So we reported that to the court as a red flag. Uh, we also reported that to the Florida Bar as, as a potential problem. So, now this was a hundred dollar example. When you edited it all up, it was over seventy thousand dollars worth of you know fees and disbursements that we call unsubstantiated that we reported to the court as such. A lot of you know some of that money, not, not all of it, has already been repaid to the guardianship assets, but the attorney still has you know more questions to answer about the the, uh, the balance of that. So, um, Anything we can't flesh out in a level two audit, we elevate to a level three audit. Uh, I mean, these are you know very intensive audits; they're very rare. Um, you know, we don't do a lot of those. Um, getting back to your question that we were talking about, the attorneys. You know, we're often asked, you know, who, who are we targeting? And depending on who we're speaking with, either the professional guardians or the attorneys or the family members, they always ask, why are you targeting you know, blank? Um, you know, the, the, the simple, I mean, we can take a look at the MetLife study, which is an interesting uh, analysis, and it showed that out of the two, you know, financial exploitation of the elderly is a $2.9 billion issue nationally. Um, and when you take a look at the specific cases, 34% of the exploitation was by a family member, a friend, a neighbor, someone that was in close proximity to the elderly person. So, um, I'm going to show you another example of those because I think they're interesting in looking at statistics. Um, th this is another petition to determine incapacity um, that a petitioner filed. Uh, in the petition, the petitioner said, that her uh, referenced her marriage 32 times in the entire petition, the long petition. She stated, my husband, wife, our marriage throughout the entire petition. In fact, uh, during the examining committee's, uh, you know, in the examining committee's report, the doctor um, asked the alleged incapacitated person questions related to his marriage and the alleged incapacitated person answered that he did not know who his wife was. The doctor took that answer and used it to form his opinion that the you know, alleged incapacitated person was truly, in fact, incapacitated. Um, that, that's all fine and well, but however, the man and wife were not married. Um, we received this certificate of divorce from a concerned family member through the, through the hotline. Uh, it turned out that the couple was divorced in 1994, uh, and they were only living together in, in the house, uh, in separate parts of the house, uh, separate, separate bedrooms, um, out of convenience and to save money. Uh, they had a daughter, uh, so they wanted to keep the family unit together, but they were not husband, husband and wife. Um, you know, another document that we received was a, a notarized statement from the ex-wife to U.S. Immigrations. And if you can speak Spanish there, it says, uh, right now we are not legally married, but still living together, uh, you know, a, a, as a family. So the, the motivation behind this, that, that petition saying that I'm the wife, was she was trying to claim a you know, spousal right to the, uh, to, to the house. Yes, um, Ken, I have yeah. Yeah. yeah, and believe it or not, those are just some of the Palm Beach County problems that we're uncovering, and you probably will see now some that they're uncovering in Pinellas. 
Okay, um, this is this is difficult to see. Um, uh, this is a, a dental bill. Um, this is, uh, and it shows a um, payment of seventeen thousand dollars. Let's go to the next one. And this is the actual bill. Um, it was a seven thousand dollar payment that the the, the uh, guardian adjusted the statement very cleverly. Um, now this is again, we got into things like the the brokerage account, the real estate. Those are easier to pick up. This is much more difficult. And we had, and we didn't discover this just because of this bill. It was the red flags that were in the other parts of this audit which made us look at everything and start scrutinizing because we saw that there was fraud. And so we went a step further. And um, when we contacted, and the reason we were able to discover this is by contacting the dental office itself um, with a judicial order um, to, to see the records. And, um, and so when they uh, gave us the financial records, we saw they didn't match with what the guardian had submitted. And so um, in this case, the guardian could have pocketed um, $9,600, the difference between the two <coughs> amounts. Um, uh, <coughs> so, like, um, next one. Uh, I can't remember what this That's one is. That's the clarification. Oh, this is just the defense is about contacting us uh, back to, to let us know that this was not um, an accurate building. The one that was submitted with the guardianship papers. Next. This is one I, uh, uh, I this is the one with that lawyer I mentioned, the prominent, or the, the prominent law firm. Um, it just it amazes me that, that, that a person could risk their whole um, livelihood over this type of um, um, item. This was not a large amount of money either. It was, it was just shocking to me. This is very interesting. Uh, because I, I would have never, good thing I'm not the um, fraud auditor. Um, looks like this is a, a bank statement. It's um, quite legitimate as far as the way it appears. Um, the only thing that really gave this away, again, this was caught because there was other fraud. I don't want you to think that we were able to you know, pick this out. Um, but you see it's a repeated use of the same numbers. Uh, and that's really what, um, what they did. If you go to the next one, there's a $170,000 balance. How much was actually in there? $10.77. Okay? And so that's a, that's a, and these are real life fraud ones, folks. These are not contrived. These are things that we've had in Pinellas County. Um, we have scrupulous people in Pinellas County. Just a few bad apples, just so you know. <laughs> not sure about that clerk there, though. And uh, next one, this is a person who actually, uh, we, we do uh, refer people to the state attorney's office. And um, this, an arrest was made, um, and uh, the, uh, it was perjury, and uh, this person had to uh, reimburse the guardianship 250000 This was, again, a parent um, issue, uh, which is, unfortunately, that's uh, a lot of these, it, it, on, it, on these ones where there's insurance proceeds due to some type of settlement, often they go into a guardianship. Um, I'll tell you another problem, a, a big frustration for us, um, is when the, what happens when a guardianship, especially for an elderly person, um, is first created, uh, they submit the, the accounting and it has the assets which should not be properly part of the guardianship. Um, and it's unfortunate because some of these trusts which have been created during the person's lifetime are excluded from the guardianship scrutiny. And a lot of times that's where the majority of their assets are. We're in a case of which, um, I, I won't mention any names obviously on this one, it's a fairly prominent family in Pinellas County um, and there, there was over a half million dollars in, that was put into the guardianship as one of the elements. That was one of the elements and then it, we had to transfer it out because it was a trust which we don't have and the courts don't have jurisdiction over. And there's great dispute within the family as to what happened to that $500,000 from the person who is the trustee of that. And, that's, and, and people come to us, matter of fact, this got rose to a level, since it's an influential family, I had a state senator call me and said, what are y'all doing about this and this missing $500,000? I said, it's not missing. I said, it's, it, it wasn't properly, it should have been included in the original guardianship, and we have no jurisdiction. The court has no, I'm speaking for the judges here, the, uh, the court has no jurisdiction over this $500,000. That's up to when um, they create this trust, 
the, that person who graded, established the trustee, the trustees of this. The trustees may be unscrupulously taking that money, but we don't have jurisdiction over that. The other family members have to ask for accountings and go through the regular civil proceedings in the court for that. But you'll get into some of these more complex matters, especially on which assets are not included in the original guardianship. If they're not included and they're not legitimately part of the guardianship, we have no right to audit, we have no right to scrutinize those documents um, once that's established that this was an improper asset that went into the guardianship. Um, and that's a source of great frustration to family members when they think there's abuses taking place. And you know when there's money involved, um, it creates family divisions um, uh, between siblings as to how that money is being spent for, for mothers. I, I have a very similar uh, audit that's uh, still open right now. It's very complex. The, the documents in this audit uh, could fill, the, fill this table probably with all the documents. But it's also a trust, uh, a multi-million dollar trust. But in my example, the- We're poor uh, in Pinellas County, <laughs> million five hundred. <laughs> but in, in, in my example, um, the trustee is also the guardian. And if that's the case, the guardianship statute opens up the trust to guardianship audits. Um, what, so far what we've done right now is go over uh, the, the, what it really takes to set up a guardianship program in your counties. Um, one of the things is, is that uh, we talked about the AO and how the enhanced audits can be created and how the Florida statute can be enlarged through the creation of an AO. That, and we talked about the fact that becoming a partner with your chief judge, talking to your probate judges is a first step. We also talked about the hiring of a uh, somebody, as Ken Napoli said, um, some of these, uh, when you get into level two and level three audit, you're really getting into audits that take some training. And so hiring the, per the right person, uh, or even somebody from the outside if you're a small county, uh, and just bring them in, depending on the size of uh, how many audit, uh, how many uh, guardianship cases you actually have, you don't need a full-time person the way that Ken and I have full-time people doing this. You may just have somebody part-time. Now I want to say that uh, our auditors are on my controller side, as they are in Ken's as well. Um, but what we do is we steal one of our uh, controller auditors and put them in the courts. So we don't, we did not hire an auditor uh, and create an audit program just for this. We have our audit program um, because of, uh, of being the county auditor as well. Um, as we also talked about meeting with the guardianship association, or if there isn't an association in your community, um, the uh, statewide association is very, very, very uh, anxious to see this program uh, being placed in, in all over the state. They think that this is the best way in which we can weed out uh, unscrupulous guardians and also build the trust of the program or the trust of guardians in the state. So they are 100% behind us. As I say, Ken and I are going to be, as well as Hector and Anthony, going to be speaking at the uh, Guardianship uh, Association, Florida Guardianship Association, and they asked us to do this. Um, but what I wanted to uh, talk uh, or uh, talk about right now is uh, the uh, hotline and the community outreach. So let me turn this over to Anthony uh, to talk about that. Okay, thank you. Uh, the, the hotline is a, an important first step. Uh, so I just wanted to go over a little bit of that. Uh, our hotline, as, as well as the Camilla's hotline, it can be accessed pretty much anywhere in the world. Uh, in fact, we, we received telephone calls to the hotline from all over Florida, uh, Canada, uh, California, New York. Uh, I even received one call from Uruguay. I don't, I don't even know where Uruguay is, but we received a call, from, you know, an international call. Um, and these were all about guardianships in Palm Beach County. Uh, our fraud hotline has also received calls about guardianships in, uh, in, uh, in Garden County, Orange County, Lake, Duval, uh, Miami-Dade, St. Lucie, Broward, and Brevard. So we've received calls about 
you know, other guardianships as well. And then the hotline is really a, a, a you know, resource for the attorneys, for the guardians, for the caretakers, for uh, family members, friends, whoever. It's their t tool to report, you know, allegations of, of you know, fraud and, and waste and, and mismanagement. Um, in addition to the phone calls, you can also send an email. You can access a report uh, submission form through the, through the clerk's website and, and send it in that way as well. Pinellas County also has a hotline. Uh, I think we gave you uh, our poster uh, that was included in your packet here. And by the way, um, in Pinellas County, and one of my county responsibilities is we run the print shop for, for Pinellas County government. So I do all the printing for the, to the sheriff, the tax collector, the board of county commission. And we have a full-fledged print shop, which is on our board side of operations. So that's why we get these fancy posters. These are uh, free to make, <laughs> to make these uh, posters up to uh, use in the probate, uh, our probate section. But anyone, you, you see this type of thing? This stops fraud from happening right here. And that's why we gave you these envelopes uh, and showed you what we do. We send these to assisted living facilities, nursing homes. Um, they put these up in, 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 in their nursing home and assisted living facilities. And that's, that's a deterrent. Because the people that are committing this type of fraud go in these types of places. And they see that someone's going to be, you know, if you think you can get away with something, you may try. If you think there's watchful eyes monitoring this, it acts as a deterrent. And this in itself um, has acted as a deterrent um, for, for the potential fraud of the elderly. Um, and, and so this, this has been a very effective means of, of, of and cheap, and, and, and it produces results. And so I would encourage you, even whatever auditing capacity you see your clerk's office, to, to put some type of uh, warning here. This costs you very little, and it has a very good positive impact that, that, that the scrutiny exists, and you're making awareness that there is a scrutiny of, of, of the accountings which are sent into guardianships. Inside your packet also is is a um, a, a CD. Uh, Anthony, you want to yeah, talk about this? Uh, there's instructions in the packet uh, on the right hand side, all the way in the back, and uh, it gives you a link uh, for a file transfer protocol. Um, no that, CD, sorry. Yeah. We decided not to put. We decided to do the links instead because the CD was too too. If you are interested, uh, the, you can download uh, all of our materials related from the administrative order to our rack cards, to our posters, to uh, the, uh, the, the press releases, to uh, uh, Kirk also recorded the PSA, it's, it's in there. We did the radio interview, it's, it's in there. So any of the uh, materials to help you start a similar program is, is contained in, in, that, uh, in that download. You know, and I think Ken said this, and, and let me just um, enhance on the fact that this guardianship program uh, that was started in Pinellas County uh, and adopted by our county, one of the things that we looked at was whether or not we could afford it. And I will say that um, this is, it may look like sitting here right now that there's a lot of expense involved and a, and a lot of time involved. You know, I want to tell you, it isn't that expensive. We don't have, unlike Pinellas County that has the luxury of having a print office, we don't have a print office, but we just took out, we went to our printer and got these, um, uh, all the red cards and the posters printed, and we did exactly uh, what Pinellas did, and, and because it's the model, and uh, we have our posters all over, uh, all over the county right now, and we send them to all the assisted living, we send them to the nurses, uh, we send them to law firms, we've met with the elder law attorneys, and we're getting calls literally from all over the, uh, all over the county, and this relationship that we are building is, there's just not enough words to be able to describe to you what, how they are seeing our office. We, they've always seen us as the gateway into the court system. 
but now they're really seeing that we have something to give to them that is is um, that actually is helping the community. Anthony, how much money have we? And I know Pinellas has a lot older program. But our program is a little more than a year. Is it a year old yet? Yes. About a year old. And how much money have we returned to the uh, to the boards? Uh, we've identified over nine hundred thousand. Not all that has been returned to the, the wards. It's in different stages in the 40s. This is almost a million dollars. And I'm going to tell you, when um, we get all kinds of incredible, incredible press on this, um, we have uh, had the opportunity that people come up to me all the time, and I know this has to happen to Ken as well, people come up to me and say thank you, you know, we can't believe it, my, my mother was being taken advantage of and now she isn't anymore, or, you know, that attorney took advantage of so many people over the years, and this is what happened in Ken's County, and now that's not happening anymore. In fact, we also get Marcia Ewing's in the room, I had a, a lady come up the other day and said, is this in, uh, do, do they have this up in Martin County? And I said, well, no, but I'm going to talk to Marcia today, you know. <laughs> so uh, if they're, um, uh, the hotline, this hotline costs us, we, we're using a county line, and how much was it? It, it, it didn't cost us anything. It, it, it's free. All we did was basically put the poster up, that's it. Put a link on our website. There's no cost to it at all. But the outreach that you get and the good that you are able to do through this program is literally invaluable. Um, what I wanted to also ask is... Sure, can I add something yes, to that? Yes, I was going to ask you... And, and one thing, too, with, uh, I realize there's you know, clerk's office, but now we have an elderly population, traditionally an elderly population. In, in counties which are smaller counties, which less elderly population, fewer guardianships, there's other ways to approach this. Um, your judge, if you if your desk auditor is is had this feeling of um, discomfort over some of the expenditures in the past, and really other than getting some, you know, doing an order to disprove and, and maybe getting some receipts and not being able to give the the type of scrutiny because they simply don't have the, the accounting sophistication to do it. This is a conversation you may want to have with your judiciary if they would order an outside firm to do it. Um, and the guardianship would have to pay the cost, obviously, of that. And that can be done. And if you have a relationship, if you know a CPA in, in, in your county who maybe is a, has good auditing skills, because not all CPAs are necessarily auditors, or, or um, especially if they're a fraud auditor, they have that designation of forensic auditor um, in your county, you can build up a rapport with that, a relationship there with them, with the judiciary, where they can order that firm to actually do the, the intense scrutiny if your people find it doesn't pass the smell test, and there's, and, but they don't know exactly how to go about um, taking those next steps to making sure that this either guardianship is fine or, or there, there is indeed a problem. And let me tell you, folks, too, um, and, and I guess this goes to somewhat Gene's question for the legal community. Um, a lot of the times we do the research and it's kind of quite legitimate. It may look strange. It may look very strange, but once we find out and, and you get the enhanced data, so it's not a witch hunt on our part. Um, that we saw, we had an RV purchased from a, uh, a guardianship for hundred some thousand dollars, and obviously that um, uh, uh, had a uh, great concern. But once we found out all the information, because the person was a um, uh, confined to a wheelchair, this was the only way to, to go, and they just had to. Plenty of money in the guardianship. This was the way to take mom around the country and something she wanted to do. Made the justification to the court, and the court said it's fine. Um, it may have looked foolish to us at the start, but once you got all the facts, it was indeed a appropriate expenditure. But what happens if it wasn't? And again, in Pinellas County, where we've already failed in our taxpayers, our citizens, and the St. Pete Times um, got that story that um, we, we didn't question a, a RV purchase that cost a couple hundred thousand, whatever it was, and, and, and let it go by, and, and the courts missed it, and the clerk's office missed it, and did pro give it proper scrutiny, and you know, it's like we've been, we've been burned once, y'all should, should do a better job than you. So that's, I'm just saying there's maybe you want to look creativity, creatively, is there a way to accomplish this in your county 
um, for an alternative way if you can't afford to bring that resource on um, your staff. Another uh, way to build this relationship with your county, and this is something that they do in Pinellas County, and it's something that we do too in Palm Beach County, and that is, is that we are uh, help train the guardians. So um, uh, Pinellas has been doing this for a very, very long time, and we found that to be extremely effective. Because when you first enter into this, and this again goes to uh, Latchell County's issue, um, they are, we, because now the clerk's office is part of the training of both the professional and the non-professional guardians, there's not even a question uh, as to what it is, why, we're, why we do what we're doing, because we're indoctrinating them at the get-go. So again, you're, you have something like this going on in your county. There's no way that you don't. It may be, uh, it may be in another county, it may be in a nearby county, I'm not sure how it works in smaller counties, but you have guardianships, you have wards, and you have training of them because it's a, board, it's a statute. So um, this, this is a way to, again, build the relationship from the very, very beginning. And the, war, and the guardians then see you as the expert in this area, and they will call, and they will, and as, as Ken just said, we had one where uh, they bought a Alzheimer's patient in an assisted living, a 60-inch flat screen television set. So, you know, one would, uh, Anthony and his team, they said, why would you buy a 60-inch television set with Alzheimer's? Well, they did their uh, level two search and found out that it was, it left it, there it was. The TV was right there in the assisted living, right there in the ward's room, and uh, with the TV on because it kept him calm. And so that got the guardian out, at that, you know, the guardian there was very, very happy that uh, we found out and were able to say that this is a scrupulous uh, uh, guardian who was doing well and in fact paying a lot of attention to their ward. So you get it on both sides, but we can't say enough, I think, about your relationship with the community by starting a program like this because you, we are then seeing, clerks are seeing as instead of that behind the scene person that is just doing paper, this is a tangible way for us to demonstrate to the public that we are professionals, that we add value to the community by the jobs that we do. Is there any questions that you have of uh, Ken, Anthony, or me, Marsha? You mean in county, guardianship training? Ken? Yeah, but in our county, the, you, you got it the last one. St. Pete uh, College does the guardianship training courses, and the Guardianship Association works with them on that, and that's who we work through also. Um, so that's, that's the end of Marsha. In our county, Ken? I want to ask a question back, though, before Marsha gets to finish the answer. How many um, counties here, when there is a family uh, guardian appointed, does the judge require some type of training? Can you raise your hand if there's a requirement of training? Okay, is there, I, I, I don't want to assume everyone else, we, we should raise our hands up and tell us if we now have that. Um, um, which counties do not have any training required with family appointed? So the they rest? have to move to waive it. But they will. Is the rest of y'all didn't? What were your answers? Donna, what are y'all doing? Okay, do you know? There's no reply. Okay. And I, I think if there's anything that working with your judiciary, yep. there, there, there should be a requirement that family guardians understand the rules. And so many times people get in trouble simply not understanding what the, what the rules are, and they put them in a very um, terrible situation. Um, and, and they may think they're doing the right thing, and they're not. So um, that's one of the biggest abuses takes place is in family guardians, and that's something you may want to consider working with your judiciary and making sure family guardians are, are mandated to do um, some type of training before they're um, appointed to be to, uh, as guardian. Ken brings up a very, very good point. We've actually, through this program, educated the judiciary on what their role was. 
And uh, again, this is confidential. Our hotline is confidential, our reports are confidential. They can't be touched through the public records laws. So this gives the judges a tremendous amount of relief whenever they are actually making a decision about the ward, about the accounting, etc. cetera. Um, we work with, by the way, Catholic Charities. Anthony, uh, in our county, just to show you that things are different, Catholic Charities is who contracts with the uh, Guardianship Association and so for training. So we actually uh, go with them. It's through the uh, university we can, through us, it's Catholic Charities. But no matter what, we don't, um, we, are, we frown on not having training for both. And in Palm Beach County now, there's virtually nobody, whether it be a family or a guard a professional, that gets out of uh, being, having to go through this training program. It is basically mandatory in this day and age for a lot of the reasons that Ken talked about, and that is that it is just too complex. These, these guardianships are just too complex today. Um, any other questions? So, uh, Joe. Right now we have about 2,700 active guardianship cases. So we have a lot. Uh, we're, you know, you may not have that many, which again, see we have I think seven or eight what Ken calls desk clerks, uh, you know, guard, uh, that do level one audits. And then uh, Anthony um, does all the level two and level three audits. And we only have one auditor. Anthony is our only auditor. Of course, he is full time. If you have other auditors, if you have, if you're the controller, if you have the controller function and you have trained auditors in your uh, office, it's really easy to train them to do these kind of level two and level three audits if they have some training. I think Ken made a very good suggestion to even hire it out. Um, because it, it, if in fact you don't have uh, auditors in house, yes. Uh, as far as how many? Um, Ken, you have one full time auditor, uh, just like I do, that comes through your Inspector General office, correct? Yeah. And how many cases do you have? Ken? Do you know how many Penelas has? I don't know what Penelas has, but our 2700 are, are just guardianship of the person, guardianship of the property, guardianship of the person property. They don't include voluntary guardianships, creamy, um, guardian advocate, uh, advocacy. Uh, that, that's just the, the 2700 is just the cases that are required to submit reports. Uh, I don't know what Penelas has. Uh, 2700. Any other questions? Yes. Okay, that's a she good. asked how, the ha how do we handle the fraud hotline? Uh, if it's a telephone call, my, uh, the telephone on my desk will ring. If I'm uh, available, it'll go down the line to the deputy, inspector general, and then finally to the inspector general. If, uh, if it's the weekend, it goes to phones. And we've included in that download uh, our phone scripts and, and Everything, the phone tree, we call it. Um, um, I receive the, uh, if I answer, uh, and I just go through some various questions, I basically interview the person. Um, we, every call that is taken, we assess to determine whether it's actionable or non actionable. Um, I have some, uh, a slide on a little bit of statistics on that. That's it. Oh, yeah. Have, yeah. Um, just to, you know, our hotline calls, um, you know, the majority of the calls that we, uh, the contacts that we get are through the, are through the telephone. Um, we had one person send us a, a U.S. Postal Service uh, uh, tip. Um, let's get that one. Um, I, I just wanted to give you, I, I have a transcript, a you know, very partial transcript of a uh, conversation that I had with someone. I'll call in the hotline. Let me read, read it to you if you can't see it way in the back. It says, uh, it says, my mother is spending, and she used the ward's name, who was a, who was a child. Uh, my mother is spending the ward's money. Uh, she went to David's bridal, 
and she bought 24 wedding dresses uh, the, the child's name. The child was the sole beneficiary of my grandmother's insurance policy and the guardian was using the money. Um, and she also took the guardian of the, the grandmother's house. And now uh, this has bothered me, I've known about this for years, it's bothered me for years. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's wrong, plain wrong, so I want to report my mother. Uh, now the, the minor child wasn't related to the, uh, to, to the guardian. Uh, so we decided, based on the call, uh, and there was sufficient red flags, we assessed it, we decided to do a level two audit on it, and we, we determined that the child was living with the grandmother. The grandmother was his sole, uh, sole caregiver. Um, uh, I'll tell you a little of the backstory on this. In, uh, in 2003, the grandmother, the grandmother's boyfriend, and the child were traveling down State Road 60, uh, their car tire blew out, uh, they lost control, uh, they wound up hitting head on a, um, a tractor trailer. Um, the, the, the boyfriend was ejected from the car, he was pronounced dead at the scene, the grandmother died upon impact. The, the child, the boy, was in the back seat, in the middle seat with a seatbelt on, he was sleeping. He survived, he had some tremendous injuries uh, you know, to him. Um, the, the, the boy was in a coma for 30 days. Now during this time period, the, they had the grandmother's funeral, and she had relatives come down from Georgia, uh, and one of the relatives was the uncle's girlfriend. When the uncle's girlfriend got to Palm Beach County, the first thing she did was raided the grandmother's bank accounts, her jewelry, her credit cards. Uh, she found all you know, uh, permanent documents, the you know, insurance policies. Uh, she took or took possession of er everything. Now, the grandmother's will named the child the sole benefactor of all of her of, of all of her state. Well, the aunt drafted a new will. Well, I'm going to call her aunt. She wasn't the aunt. She was the girlfriend. Uh, she drafted a new will. Um, she forged the grandmother's signature. She postdated everything. Um, and she used that will in to, to and a couple other forged documents to open up the guardianship. Well, let me show you one other thing that, that she did. Uh, this is the grandmother's uh, death certificate. And you can see that it indicates that she was, uh, you know, she was killed in the, uh, on March 23rd, 2003. Now that's an important year to remember, 2003. Um, you know, during our assessment, we determined that the grandmother owned the house, and we reviewed public records, and I saw a satisfaction of mortgage, and the date of the satisfaction of mortgage was right after the uh, grandmother's death, so de death. So which it kind of seemed odd to me, so I was wondering, I, I kind of determined that the payoff was about $58,000, so I was wondering where this money, this $58,000 came, came from. Um, you know, could it be the, the, the call or the daughter reference a life insurance policy, so could it be, you know, some, some of the proceeds from this life insurance? Well, it turned out that the, the girlfriend, Ann, um, received $160,000 worth of insurance that was intended uh, for the for the child. And top things off. Now remember the date of the death. What, what the year was? You remember what the year was? 2003. A quick claim for the grandmother's house was filed in September of 2008. Um, it was signed by the grandmother. It was notarized. It was witnessed. Um, so you know, uh, this is still an open. Open investigation of law enforcement. Um, the aunt, the witness, the notary uh, should be given, uh, I won't say by who, but she should be given a knock on the door uh, any day. This is a very open investigation. So, um, and you know, keep in mind that all these things we found would have never been found during that statutory minimum uh, audit. So, this is my trigger item. A quick claim deed of coming out of the guardianship should be a automatic trigger item that, that the golf course would be. Oh, I mean, that's pretty, pretty big.
Uh, you know, another area that uh, we failed to mention, and I know it happens in Ken's County, and it certainly happens in ours, we have become extremely good friends with law enforcement. And when we are doing law enforcement's work, on something like this, they come in, FDLE and us, we, I, I can't even tell you the level of respect that they have for our office just through this program. We're not just taking traffic tickets anymore, you know, we're not just doing the criminal cases, but we're actually talking to law enforcement toe-to-toe -to -toe about these cases, and we're putting the bad guys in jail. And just as Ken showed, they're putting people in jail. I, I mean, we're not proud of the fact that, that we are. What we're proud of the fact of is, is that we are finding and helping our community through this program. How many people have we reported to the bar? How many attorneys have we reported to the bar? We have three. three. Has any of them been disbarred yet? Uh, hearings this month. This is, so, you know, and I'm going to tell you, we've got 6,300 attorneys in Palm Beach County. And, you know, not all of them are honest. And the deterring effect that, uh, that Ken was just talking about, this is rippling through the bar right now. And these attorneys are coming in and saying, it's not worth it to do guardianships anymore for the very reasons that Anthony and Ken pointed out to you. I just can't even emphasize on what kind of collateral effect that this has had for our office in the public's deeper understanding that number one, we're professionals, and number two, we are their watchdogs, and we are proving it through this program. Just, just so you don't know, we have never made a referral to the Florida Bar, but our judges have. Okay, just, just, just <laughs> because we're now hooked to the hip with DCF. And they're looking to us as another outlet for them to find abuse of the elderly or abuse of the incapacitated. So, you know, it's just such a win-win uh, for the community and for the whole state that uh, Ken and I, um, would, uh, as, as clerks, we would actually challenge the rest of the clerks that are, are uh, in uh, the room right now, and frankly, all 67 of us, to look at this program and to add it to, to uh, the duties that, that we do um, because it really is something that helps our community. Okay. Listen, we thank you very, very much. And if you have any questions, Ken will be available as well as Anthony and myself. Thank you.